Good evening, everybody. I can't believe it's Thursday already and we're on lecture four. It's flying. Tonight, we're going to be talking about galaxies and dark matter. And uh, the background image on this slide is one of my all-time favorite images in astronomy in the universe. <laughs> this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So this is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of a patch of sky which was blank. There was nothing else um, in that little patch. And Hubble stared at this for the equivalent of um, 11 solid days. In this image, well, you could take a wild guess. How many galaxies do you think you can see in there? They're more than 10,000. Almost every blob on this picture is a galaxy. I think I can see a couple of stars. Here, here's a star, and there's one, and there. But everything else in that picture is a galaxy. And so I, I find it mind-blowing whenever I look at it. <laughs> the other amazing thing that you can notice when you look at this image is the huge variety in the shapes and the colors and the sizes of the galaxies. Um, here you can see a wonderful spiral galaxy over here, big one, here's another one. You also see a lot of blue objects, so um, bluer spirals. You see a lot of red elliptical galaxies. And this image has, has many, many papers, scientific papers in the literature have been written about the data in this image because it is able to see galaxies deeper than we've ever been able to see them before, way back to when galaxies uh, probably first started forming. And I'm not going to go into all that today, but from this image we've been able to learn that galaxies were much smaller in the past, much more disordered uh, in their appearance and their morphologies. And so these things give us a hint as to how they've evolved over time. So if you thought that was cool, look at this. This is the Hubble Extremely Deep Field. <laughs> And this one is the equivalent of about 23 days of solid exposure time. And this is actually a subset of, uh, a sub um, area of the previous um, image. This image contains five and a half thousand galaxies, but it's not as big an area. In fact, I think per degree, it's something like 50% more galaxies per degree in this um, image than in the previous one with the deeper exposure. And again, you can see just the huge variety. Things start, I mean, it's amazing to think that was just a, an area of, of sky, that of, of space that, you know, bef when you look out with the naked eye, it's, it's blank and any other telescope. To give you an idea of the size of this image, that's what it looks like compared to the full moon. So packed into this little area over here, five and a half thousand galaxies. So now extrapolate that across the entire sky and you'll have hundreds of billions. <laughs> right, so let's start with um, what is a galaxy exactly? Well, a galaxy is an enormous collection of stars and interstellar matter. That's the gas and the dust, stellar remnants that are left over after massive stars have evolved and blown off their envelopes or have gone supernova, black holes, etc., planets, which is, it's this huge collection of these things which is isolated in space and held together by its own gravity. So this, for example, is a nice um, typical spiral galaxy which gives you an impression of, of what, what we think a galaxy is. And it feels a bit funny for me to be standing here defining what a galaxy is, but less than 100 years ago, we only knew of our own galaxy for sure. And there was a lot of discussion about whether other galaxies actually even existed in the universe. So less than 100 years ago, around 1919, there was a famous event called the Great Debate held in uh, the USA in San Francisco. And these two astronomers were the um, people who stood up to um, give both sides of the debate. They were not um, 
it wasn't a personal debate, they were just representing the two big views of the time. And it was hoped by the end of the debate that we would be able to wrap up with a, um, these little nebulae that people were finding, these fuzzy blobs in the sky were actually distant galaxies or whether they were part of our own galaxy. So Harlow Shapley presented the side that the Milky Way was the entire universe, everything um, that, that existed was inside our galaxy. He is well known for measuring the size of our galaxy um, using variable stars, and I'll explain roughly how you do that. And he showed um, actually very importantly that the sun was not the center of the Milky Way. This was almost as big a leap as going from a geocentric solar system to a heliocentric solar system. On the other side of the, the debate was um, Heber Curtis, and he was representing the idea that the Milky Way was just one galaxy out of many in the universe. Um, it was a sort of, it was known as the island universe idea where you had these um, collections of, of material separate from each other in the universe. I mean, one of the reasons that it was not clear that things like this were external galaxies was just because telescopes weren't as good as they are now. The images that you could make with them um, were, were nothing like this. And so it was difficult to actually see individual stars in these fuzzy nebulae. It was also incredibly difficult to know how far away they were. And, and so if you don't have any idea of how far away the thing is that you're looking at, it's incredibly difficult to know whether it's inside or outside the galaxy. And even to this day, in astronomy, one of our biggest struggles is always measuring distance. Measuring the distance to an object is, is hard. So five years later, um, some more work was being done in the background. Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named, solved the great debate because he found Cepheid variable stars inside the great uh, nebula in Andromeda, which we now know as the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, he measured the distance to these uh, Cepheid stars, which were in this nebula, um, and he, he got a distance of about 900,000 light years, which everybody agreed was bigger than they could have imagined and way bigger than they thought that the, the Milky Way could possibly be. And so that really um, started the era of extragalactic astronomy, the, the realization that there were these island universes, that there were many galaxies external to our own. He got the distance wrong um, because at the time the calibrations to um, using Cepheids weren't, weren't as good as they are today. Um, but we now know that Andromeda is about two and a half million light years away. So how would you have done this with Cepheid variables? I'm going to show you quickly because as I said at the beginning of this course, I like people to take away a little bit how we do the astronomy and not just somebody did it and believe me. So how Cepheids work is um, that they are massive stars that are evolving off the main sequence. So they've lived on the main sequence, they've burned all their hydrogen into helium in the core, and now they are going on to the next phase of their lives. And part of this phase of, of um, evolution for massive stars is that they'll go through a period where they pulsate, where their radius increases and decreases regularly, and as a result, they will appear to get brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter over a regular interval. And so if you were to measure the light coming from a Cepheid over time, you might see something like this, where it gets brighter and then fainter and then brighter and then fainter. And these periods can, can um, range between about one day and 100 days. Now, Henrietta Leavitt, who was um, working at the Harvard Colle College Observatory in the early 1900s, was the person who realized that there was a relationship between the period of the um, light curve for Cepheids and their uh, luminosities. Because if you can measure the distance to a Cepheid star using, for example, parallax, then you can get a good idea of its distance and you can measure its luminosity independently. And then if you uh, plot that against the pulsation period, they found a nice relation. And it's now known as the period luminosity relation. 
And the great thing about that is, if you then observe a Cepheid whose distance you do not know, you can automatically, using this relation, if you know its pulsation period, you can put it on the relation, read off what its luminosity should be, and using that, you can calculate its distance. So these are always the things we like in astronomy. So you can measure its apparent brightness with, with your telescope. You use the period luminosity relation to estimate the luminosity, and then you can get the distance. So that's how Hubble would have done it to measure the distance to Andromeda. Hubble then became very um, active in galaxy uh, research. He uh, used the Mount Wilson telescope um, and he uh, studied many of these, these newly classified galaxies. And as, as we were talking about the other day about stars, well, the first thing you have to do when you find something new in science is you have to put it in its box. You have to classify it. And he came up with a classification scheme that we now call the Hubble sequence, where he um, put galaxies in the, in the following criteria. They were spirals, barred spirals, elliptical galaxies, lenticulars, which is just referring to the fact that they looked a little bit lens-shaped. Today, we also call these by their code name S0s. And uh, then the ones that didn't fit into any of the above, they just called irregulars. And uh, so I'm going to just show you some pretty pictures of, of these, because I don't think anyone ever gets tired of looking at galaxies. Um, so spiral galaxies, um, here's just some examples. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of variety even in the spirals themselves. Um, and today we, we talk about the structure of spiral galaxies in terms of having a bulge in the center surrounded um, by a disk of stars, and of course they must have spiral arms. Some galaxies only have one spiral arm that wraps around, some have many spiral arms. Some of them appear quite sort of clumpy. They usually have gas, I'm sorry, dust, which you can see um, by the dark patches over here along the spiral arms. Of course they do have a lot of gas because they're um, making stars. And often spirals are quite blue in color because they typically hosting uh, young stars. Another kind of um, spiral are what we call barred spiral galaxies. And um, often we just put spirals and barred spirals together, but on the Hubble sequence, he separated the two. And a barred spiral is the same, it has a, it has a bulge, but it has a bar-like structure that extends through the bulge, and then the arms seem to come from the end of the, bu of the bar. And again, um, so it has a disk, which is where the spiral arms are located, and then a bulge in the bar. And uh, depending on how tightly wrapped the arms are, we would classify them into subgroups of, of um, barred spiral galaxy. Elliptical galaxies are a little bit harder to classify. What we do with these guys is um, we classify them by how squashed they are from being a circle. So we would call them an E0 if they're rather circular looking, and an E7 if they're more a cigar shape. And um, it's also quite difficult to tell because really they're classified by their viewing angle. You can think of elliptical galaxies as, as a rugby ball shape anything between a, a sort of elongated rugby ball to a soccer ball. But the problem is if you look at a rugby ball end on, it'll look like a soccer ball. <laughs> so it's quite difficult um, by just looking at the, uh, the um, projection of elliptical galaxies exactly what shape they are. Um, but here's a variety of, of these. And elliptical galaxies can range um, between giant sizes, which are hundreds of kiloparsecs across, that's many times bigger than the Milky Way, to very tiny little galaxies, which we would call dwarf ellipticals, which are about one kiloparsec across. Lenticular galaxies are somewhere sort of in between an elliptical and a spiral. So lenticular galaxies um, have a bulge, like a spiral galaxy, and they have a disk, like a spiral galaxy, but they do not have spiral arms. So they, they're sort of like frisbees, I suppose. <laughs> um, and some of them even have bars. 
but without spiral arms coming off. And we think that they're probably some kind of um, intermediate evolutionary stage uh, somewhere along the line. Irregular galaxies, well, here's some good examples. <laughs> You can see that they don't fit into any of the above categories. And uh, these are our neighbors, the large and the small Magellanic clouds. And uh, here's another irregular galaxy over here. So these are typically usually quite small galaxies in comparison to a spiral or a, a large elliptical. So what Hubble did was he classified all the galaxies and then he put them on what we call the Hubble sequence or what we now call the Hubble tuning fork diagram, because it looks like a tuning fork. And uh, so the ellipticals lived along here, and as I was saying, E zeros are the most circular ones, down to E7, and then here the lenticular galaxies over here, and then it branches off into the spirals and the barred spirals, and then there's no space on the tuning fork for the irregulars. And it's thought that Hubble, um, there's a bit of controversy in the literature. Some people say that actually Hubble thought this might be a sort of evolutionary um, diagram for how he thought galaxies might evolve. So, so some people say that they think he thought that galaxies may evolve from being elliptical into this more complicated structure, um, this more complicated spiral kind of structure. Today, we know that that's not actually correct. and. <coughs> Excuse me. If a galaxy is isolated, in other words, it's living quite merrily on its own in space, not interacting with anyone else, and there are no other big galaxies nearby, then it will keep its shape. There's nothing to cause it to change what it looks like in terms of its morphology or structure. Um, of course, once it uses up its gas, it won't be able to make new stars, so it will appear to, to get redder and redder and redder, and, and eventually, I suppose, it'll, it'll get fainter and fainter and fainter as well, but it won't change from being an elliptical shape to a spiral shape or from a spiral shape to an elliptical shape. However, something that does change the shapes of galaxies very significantly is when they have interactions with other galaxies. So if two galaxies get too close together, then their mutual gravity can completely change what they look like. And so here's a wonderful collage of what can happen <laughs> if you get too close. And um, you can see that these two galaxies are colliding um, and they are making all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes um, <coughs> that you can find. So these would have been spiral galaxies, but their shapes are being completely distorted because of the tidal and gravitational interactions that are happening uh, with their neighbors. So I really like um, this picture over here of the Hubble tuning fork diagram. Um, this is a, a lovely image that has been made using Sloan Digital Sky Survey galaxies where they've taken uh, typical galaxies um, of the different types, and they've actually put the real images in the, in the diagram. And uh, something that you'll notice when you look at it is that there is a color difference between this side and that side. These galaxies look red, and these ones look blue. And that's not just because of particular galaxies they picked. These are pretty average. And so the question is, and this is something that um, we, tr what we try to answer, is what gives the galaxies their different colors? So here we have an elliptical galaxy that's, that's looking rather reddish, and here we have a lovely blue spiral galaxy. At least its spiral arms are very blue, its bulge is redder. And of course the answer is, well, it has to be the stars that are giving them this color, but it's got to do with the ages of the stars, the typical stars in those galaxies. So I'm going to bring up the HR diagram again, just to remind you. And when we look at it, we've got spectral type or surface temperature or color over here, where our cooler stars are red. So the whole right-hand side of this picture are, are red stars. These are the bright ones, the red giants. And on this side of the diagram, we've got our blue stars, where our bright ones are the blue giants. And the difference is that in these two kinds of bright star is that the blue giants are the main sequence stars. They're the young stars. 
that are, are still on the main sequence, still living their normal lives. These are the evolved stars who have left the main sequence and are nearing the end of their lives. And so this is telling us that the stellar populations in our two different kinds of uh, galaxy here, in this one, it's got, most of its bright stars are old. They're mainly red giants. And in this galaxy, the things that are really giving it its color are young, bright, hot stars, which don't live very long. And, and so from that, we can tell that actually star formation is ongoing in this galaxy because we're seeing um, even these short-lived stars that are, have newly turned on. And uh, over here, there isn't active star formation. And this is one of the big puzzles in galaxy evolution studies. When we look at the galaxies in the local universe and we classify them by their brightness and their colors, we find that you have one big clump of red things that seems dead and one big clump of blue things that are actively star forming. And we don't know exactly why that is <laughs> and why galaxies seem to be either very actively forming stars or not forming them at all, with very little in between. There isn't much going on in between those two groups. And so this is a huge area of, of research at the moment, is to try to understand what drives galaxies to evolve from being actively star forming to no longer star forming. Now, over the last couple of days where we've looked at stars and we've looked at exoplanets, we first focused on our own environment. So when we looked at stars, we looked at the sun to try and understand other stars better. And we looked at our own solar system and how we think it formed to try to understand exoplanet systems. And so you, you would think it would be natural that if we're going to look at galaxies today, we should start with our own galaxy, the Milky Way. But it turns out it's a bit hard, actually. Um, when you're inside a galaxy, to study it, because you can't zoom out and look at what it looks like from the outside. It's actually quite tricky. In, in a funny sense, it's easier to study galaxies external to ours than it is to study our own in some aspects. So I, I really like this image. It was taken by Dr. Steve Potter from the um, uh, South African Astronomical Observatory in, in Observatory uh, when he was at Sutherland one evening. And I think it's, a, it's a, a really beautiful picture of the Milky Way. But of course, it doesn't look like any of those pictures I just told you, because we're sitting inside it, and we're looking towards the galactic bulge from inside one of its spiral arms. So the best picture I could find you of the Milky Way is this one, <laughs> an artist's impression. And that's because, you know, we haven't yet figured out even interstellar travel, let alone intergalactic travel, and so we can't zoom out and have a look back at what it looks like. But this is our best um, estimation, given all the observations that astronomers have managed to do using lots of different wavelengths. So we think that we live in a barred spiral galaxy, actually, and uh, our galaxy is thought to have quite a number of spiral arms, and we live out here, about just over halfway out from the center. So we think that our galaxy is about 30 kiloparsecs across, or 100,000 light years across. And we live about eight kiloparsecs from the center, about halfway out um, towards the edge. And um, this, uh, the reason that we know about the spiral structure, actually, because this is incredibly hard to measure, is uh, from looking at observations of the neutral hydrogen gas in the galaxy using radio telescopes and mapping out the spiral arms given the different Doppler frequencies of uh, the, the gas at different distances. Um, and it's quite a tricky measurement to make. So this is what we know today, but of course it's taken a few hundred years to get to this point. Um, and, and how did it start off? So people around the late 1700s were asking, well, how big is the Milky Way? And William Herschel um, 
try to map the galaxy. So William Herschel is the, the famous astronomer royal who is the father of John Herschel who came to Cape Town and after whom Herschel Girls School is named and, and uh, he, he did a number of surveys. This was his father. So uh, William Herschel tried to map the galaxy and what he did was he um, was famous for building very large telescopes at the time and he measured the positions of stars in the sky um, in all directions, and he had to make an assumption that all stars are roughly the same brightness. And so the fainter they looked, that must mean that they're further away. He obviously did not yet, we didn't, I mean, that was the late 1700s. He, we didn't know anything about atomic physics. We didn't, he, people didn't know anything about all the different kinds of stars. And so this was a pretty reasonable assumption at the time. The other thing that he didn't know about at the time was that there's dust, interstellar dust, um, between us and other stars in the, in the nebulae and, and in interstellar space. And the problem with dust is that it absorbs and scatters starlight. And so it can obscure things and make things appear fainter than they really are. And so this is part of, partly the reason that he ended up with this funny shape. Um, and where the, the galaxy looked like it had these sort of long fingers in various directions was because probably when he was looking in this direction there was some clumpy gas that was blocking his observations in that direction and similarly in some of the other directions. The interesting thing though was that he did actually have a model for our Milky Way where the sun wasn't at the center and again that was really because of dust. We had to wait until the early 1900s for um, Harlow Shapley to do his measurements um, to really get a better idea of the three-dimensional proper size of our galaxy. So what Harlow Shapley did was he looked at star clusters in our galaxy, specifically these kinds of star clusters called globular clusters, which are spherical clusters of stars. And they, um, many of them contain um, variable stars, which he could then use to measure the distance to them. And what he found was that the globular clusters measured out the spherical volume. Um, and the diameter of this spherical volume was about 30 kiloparsecs, which is as big as we think our galaxy is today. The other interesting thing that he found, so all these pink blobs are the globular clusters positions. And the other interesting thing that he found that I referred to earlier was that the sun wasn't at the center of the globular cluster distribution. It was offset. The center lay over here and the sun was about eight kiloparsecs away. Um, and as I said earlier, at the time, this was quite a, a major thing that, you know, not only things happened fast in the early 1900s. First of all, we figured out that the Milky Way wasn't the only galaxy. Then the sun wasn't even at the center anymore. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of really uh, interesting physics was, was being discovered. Um, and as I said later, uh, earlier, sorry, it took uh, uh, till later on, um, more like the, the 60, 50s and 60s, to figure out the spiral structure of the galaxy from the neutral hydrogen observations using radio telescopes. Because in the early 1900s, radio telescopes hadn't been invented yet. We had to wait for the 30s for that to happen. So when we look at the Milky Way today, given all the information that we know about it, we uh, we live in our, our barred spiral, but what I didn't tell you earlier was that it, uh, uh, in addition to the disc, the spiral disc with the spiral arms and the bulge with the bar in the center, we also have a halo, a sort of spherical halo um, as part of the structure of our galaxy where a lot of old stars and globular clusters um, are located. So not only globular clusters, but also individual stars. So that's, that's what we think our galaxy looks like today. And um, one of the big things when we talk about galaxies and our own galaxy is, so why do they have spiral arms? What causes them? And, you know, naively you would think, well, you know, they are spinning. Spiral galaxies are rotating about their, their centers. So maybe they just, as they're rotating, the gas gets dragged out and it makes a nice spiral pattern. But it turns out that that's actually not the answer. Because 
eventually what would happen is you would no longer see the spiral structure if that were, were the, the driver for the spiral arms. Eventually, after a few winding times, after the galaxy had gone round a few times, it would have been washed out. It would have been all wound up so tight, it would look like a, a lenticular, and the, the spiral structure wouldn't remain anymore. And given that we estimate the, our galaxy to be about 13.2 billion years, it certainly would no longer have spiral structure, and nor would many others. And so people had to start looking for other explanations for the spiral structure. And our best um, proposition is that it's actually what we call spiral density waves. So as the um, disk material is rotating about the uh, center of the galaxy, the material passes through regions of higher density, which compress the gas and dust and cause the formation of new generations of stars. So if you actually look at the spiral arms and spiral galaxies, you'll notice that on the, uh, le on the, yeah, the leading edge, you'll find older stars. Then you'll find younger stars, O and B type stars, and then you'll find dense dust, which is now being compressed by these spiral density waves. And this is where the new generation of, of stars is being formed, which will then um, move, as the material moves around the galaxy through this um, density pattern, you'll get the new generations of stars forming. And these ones will age, and these ones will fade or evolve or go supernova. So you've got to think about the um, stars and the gas and the density waves as separate. Um, the pattern itself is not tied to the material. Okay, The material is moving through the pattern. And it's, it, it sounds a bit odd, but a nice analogy that I like to use is traffic jams. Um, this is a lovely illustration of a density wave where the, the pattern is not tied to the individual material. So, for example, here we have a narrowing in the road causing a region of higher density because the cars have to squash together as they move through this narrowing. But the individual cars are not stationary. They, this yellow car is not staying there. It's moving past, and then these ones are moving in behind it, and when they get to that position, they are also squashed together. So the cars are moving, but the traffic jam um, pattern remains there. So you can think of that um, as a nice analogy to the spiral density waves. Now, it's not um, entirely wrapped up what causes these spiral density waves, and uh, there's probably more than one mechanism, um, and people are still uh, working on this and trying to, to understand um, better how it works. Some people believe that uh, star formation itself might be able to drive these kinds of patterns. So, for example, if you had uh, young stars being formed in this kind of um, layout over here in a, in a molecular cloud, after a certain amount of time, they would um, age and they'd evolve until eventually they would become supernovae. And as they explode, they would send out their material at high velocities, causing shock waves in the interstellar medium around them and creating new generations or kick-starting um, star formation in those gas clouds where their shock waves um, went. And so you would get new uh, areas of star formation um, on each side. Now, this is obviously a very simplified picture, and I'm a bit hard pressed to see how it can become spiral in shape, <laughs> but uh, the models, the computer models, um, can, can generate spiral waves um, in this way spiral patterns, I should say, in this way. Other things that we've noticed is that often some of the most grand design spiral galaxies that we um, observe often have a, a nearby neighbor, a smaller nearby neighbor that they're interacting with. And so we think that that's possibly a hint that the gravitational interaction with a neighboring galaxy can also lead to these spiral density waves and, um, and, and drive the spiral structure. Other things that might be responsible are instabilities um, near the bulge, or if you have a bar in your galaxy, you may also um, cause some asymmetries and, and turbulence and all sorts of things that could possibly lead to these 
density waves. So we're still, this is still an area, I can't tell you the final answer, but uh, stay tuned. Um, this is just one nice uh, picture of a star a burst galaxy where you can see actually that there's a ring of um, star formation that happened in this galaxy. Well, it's sort of a common radius around. So something happened in this galaxy that caused a region of high density all in, the, in this ring-like pattern and caused a whole burst of stars to form together um, at that location. So these things are possible and um, it's just how, how the exact um, mechanics work need to be worked out. So we've looked at the shapes of spirals of our own galaxy. Something you would definitely want to do is try to calculate how much it weighs, right? How much mass is there in this thing? It's, it's very big, it consists of many stars, it has a lot of gas in it. How much does it weigh? What's its mass? Um, and so people have tried to do this um, for a long time, most of last century. They um, use different methods. So one way that uh, you measure mass, uh, it's, it's the, the way you measure mass in astronomy, is you try to find something in orbit around the thing that you want to measure the mass of, and that will, that will help you get to the answer. So um, if you want to measure the mass of a star, then it's good to find a binary companion, and uh, if you can look at the orbital properties, then you can um, get the, the mass of the, the thing being orbited. So if we just use good old Newtonian um, physics, we have a force that is keeping a body in orbit around another one, and we set that force equal to the gravitational attraction, so that these two things are balanced. The, the orbiting body is not falling into the uh, the one that it is orbiting, and then we the little the little mass of your um, orbiting body cancels out, and you're left with the mass of the thing that you want to measure. So if you solve for the mass of the thing that you want to measure, then what you need to go and actually measure to to get that mass out is the speed of the test particle or the body in orbit around it. Um, at a particular radius. And obviously if you want to measure that, um, the whole of that mass, you want to go right to the very edge of it, as far um, as, as big as it is, and measure the velocity of your little test particle at that radius. So people tried this, they, they looked at stars in our neighborhood and they tried to measure their rotation velocities around the center of our galaxy. People have also observed, um, they looked at planetary nebulae, remember the endpoints of stars like our sun once it's blown off its outer atmosphere. Um, and those are quite nicely distributed throughout the galaxy, close to the center, in the middle, further out, right on the edges, so that they could um, sample the velocities at different radii. Um, and, uh, but the real turning point came when people could use the neutral hydrogen gas to, to measure very far out and look at um, how fast the gas was rotating at the outer reaches of the, of the um, Milky Way. So what we do, this is just another way to write it, is if we want to measure the mass, then what we do is we make what we call a rotation velocity curve. So the rotation velocity of, of a particle at a particular radius will be proportional to the mass of the body that it's orbiting and the radius that it's at. And this is just because of Kepler's laws. So if I have a nice big spiral galaxy over here, what I would expect, now I'm drawing a, a graph on top of it. So this is the center of the galaxy and this is as I move outwards. This is its edge, pretty much, and that's way out past the edge of the galaxy. And what I'm putting on this axis over here is the speed of a star or the gas or a test particle at that particular distance from the center. That's what, that's what this graph is showing me. So if I were to go and measure this, I would expect the following. I'd expect that close by 
to the center, the, uh, where, where there's um, a high density of material. You've got lots of stars close together. It's a high density environment. So the mass grows quickly. You'd expect the velocity to shoot up because the mass is growing fast, but the, the radius is quite small. And then as I'm moving away from uh, further and further from the center, I would expect my velocity to sort of stay roughly constant or maybe drop a little bit. And then when I reach the edge, the mass is no longer growing because I've hit the edge of my galaxy, but I'm going at bigger and bigger distances, so I'd expect my velocity to drop off because I'm going to a bigger circle but no more mass and an even bigger circle and no more mass. So my velocity should drop until eventually close to zero. Now the issue was we got what was called the rotation curve problem. When you go and measure the rotation curve of our galaxy, you see the red line. It doesn't drop off. If you measure the gas, the hydrogen gas's rotation velocity further and further away from the edge of the stars, the rotation curve stays what we call flat. And the only thing that we could, th well, well, one of the only ways you can account for that is that what's happening in this formula over here is as I'm increasing my radius further and further, I must be increasing the mass that's encompassed in that radius more and more as well so that I can keep this velocity constant. So in other words, what this is telling us is that there is far more mass of material in our galaxy than we can see. And so that is dark matter. That's what we call dark matter. We don't know what it is. We can't see it. It's not emitting any light. It's not the stars, and it's not the gas. It's something else, and we call that the dark matter. So what we think is happening is that our galaxy is sitting in a big halo of dark matter. And please don't ask me what it is because I have no idea, <laughs> and nor does anybody else. <laughs> um, people are actively trying to find out what it is uh, as we speak. Um, so the thing about dark matter is that it has never been detected at any electromagnetic wavelength. This stuff, whatever it is, does not interact via the electromagnetic um, force of nature. It does not emit light. So we can't go and look for any little photons that are coming from it because it, it just doesn't interact that way. It only seems to interact gravitationally. So we know it's there because we can see that it has an effect on the rotation velocity of the gas at a very high radius from the center of our galaxy. So our, our, the gas knows it's there, but that's the only interaction that we, we know that it, it um, obeys. It only seems to interact gravitationally, and we can't, and, and so, um, yes, at this point it's very hard to find what it is. It turns out, of course, that our galaxy is not particularly unique in having dark matter. That would be very weird. But actually, um, all spiral galaxies seem to behave the same way. Um, this was a, a pretty seminal paper from 1978, where um, Rubin and Ford and um, Sonard measured the rotation curves of other spiral galaxies outside our own, and they found the same thing. So some of them had some wiggles. This one's particularly interesting that at high radii, it actually seemed to be getting bigger. Um, certainly no, no hint of dropping. So all of them have flat rotation curves with some wiggly behavior, possibly. Um, and this was really um, pointing towards the fact that dark matter must be found in, in many places, in many galaxies, and, and yeah, the problem became bigger and bigger. So i just um, like to point out the Rubin here was Vera Rubin. Um, she was a, a very famous astronomer in the field, and um, especially in terms of dark, dark matter, and unfortunately she passed away last, um, on Christmas Day last year, at the end of last year. And so uh, I did want to make this little tribute to her because um, she, she made a huge contribution to this, to this area of galaxy, uh, of, of galaxy um, studies. Now, 
that wasn't the first time that dark matter had ever been postulated. The 1970s was, was uh, relatively late, actually. Way back in the 1930s, Fritz Zwicky, who was an um, astrophysicist at Caltech, had been observing the coma cluster of galaxies. Um, so this is a, a reasonably nearby cluster of galaxies. So um, here are some, some bigger ones. There are smaller galaxies in the cluster. And what he was doing was looking at their velocities and trying to estimate the mass, given the velocities of those galaxies, the mass of the cluster. And uh, he found that the mass of the cluster must be about 400 times bigger than the mass of the individual galaxies that he could estimate. So he, he just couldn't get around this. He was like, they, you know, they're moving way too fast, given how much mass I can see if I just look at them and add them up. And so he was the first person to, to sort of say, oh, maybe there's something else in this cluster, some dark matter. But that got sort of left. And then when, it, when we came back to looking at the rotation curves of individual spiral galaxies, it, it reared its head again, this dark matter. So people have found dark matter and hints towards it in different, looking in different places. In fact, galaxy clusters, um, we think, uh, have big dark matter halos. This is a, a picture of the galaxy cluster Abel 1689. That's a very massive cluster. And uh, so every galaxy in, in this, well, all the big, big ones in, in this image are part of this cluster. So it turns out, I didn't mention that galaxies don't typically hang out on their own. They tend to rather live in groups or clusters. And what you can see in this image, it looks a little bit like it might have some problems with it. It's got some sort of funny streaks. You can see some you know, little blue issues with it here. It turns out those are not problems with the image. Those are actually images of background galaxies. This is what we call a gravitational lens. So yesterday when we were talking about exoplanets and microlensing, remember I was saying if you had a background star and something massive moved in front of it and distorted the space a little bit, then the light from that distant star would also get distorted coming towards me and that object would appear brighter. Well, what a gravitational um, lens does is it works exactly the same way. So this is just an illustration. Imagine that you've got a, a lens and a galaxy over here in the foreground. Maybe it's a cluster, actually, or an individual massive galaxy. And in the background, you have a bright light source. We'll call it a quasar. That's just a, a galaxy with a very um, active black hole. What, what can happen if this galaxy is in the right position with respect to our line of sight to this quasar and it's massive enough, it will distort space-time around it, and so the light from this quasar will appear to bend on its way to us. And when we then image it, we will appear to make a couple of images of it. And, and people have observed these. They found an image over here. This is a real image. Um, taken of, this is a foreground galaxy, and then this is a background quasar, which has been imaged four times. It's four images of the same quasar, the same background object. And so you can imagine that sometimes if you get a wine glass and you um, look at a candle through a wine glass and you just angle it the right way, you can see different images of your candle. Try that at home tonight <laughs> or after dinner. Um, and it's, it's the same thing that's happening because the, the shape of the glass is all curvy. Well, this is what is happening to space. Space is going all curvy, and it's giving us multiple images of the same background object. So this is actually what you're seeing over here in this cluster. Clusters are very massive because they're the mass of all the individual galaxies added up together, plus the dark matter. And, and so what can happen is that the light from distant background objects gets distorted on its way through to us, and we see it spread out in these funny patterns. And this is actually incredibly useful because it allows us to observe further away objects more easily because we're seeing their light lensed towards us. Um, and actually sometimes it's magnified or brightened, and so it's easier to see distant objects with these sorts of lenses. Now, these lenses um, can be modeled using physical models, 
And when we, when we do that, we realize that actually there must be more mass in those galaxy clusters than just the individual uh, galaxies that we can see. We can get a bit clever as well and we can try to add up the mass of the gas that we know exists between these galaxies, add that into the equation, but it's still not enough mass to account for how strong the lenses are. And so this is an, more evidence that there must be dark matter in these galaxy clusters that is um, causing these lenses and causing um, us to see these effects. People can actually go as far as trying to model the distribution of the dark matter because you, you can actually do that given um, how you observe the background object to look in your picture. You can um, undo the lensing effect, so to speak, and you can figure out where the lensing material must be clumped. And so this is actually a model of the dark matter distribution in this galaxy field over here. So this is what, what um, some physicists, astrophysicists have done. And you'll see that it's clumpy. It's not uniformly distributed. It's actually quite clumpily distributed, this dark matter. And it has gaps between it. And it reminds us, um, it, it, it looks just like the structures that we see when we look at galaxies um, on large scales. So I'm going to quickly zoom out and show you what, um, what we see at large scales for real galaxies. Forget the dark matter for a minute. This picture over here is showing you in velocity and, and uh, spatial coordinate um, the locations of thousands of galaxies that we've measured in the sky. So every black dot, this is looking in the north direction, this is looking in the south direction, and every black dot on this picture is the position of a galaxy whose redshift we have measured here we've got its, its velocity, its redshift, and its position in the sky. And you'll see that these are not randomly distributed. They're not just uniformly black and white dots. You can see that the little black dots tend to clump, as I was saying. Galaxies like to live in clusters and groups, and it turns out that clusters of galaxies like to live in superclusters of galaxies, and that superclusters like to live in filamentary wall-like structures in the universe. And so what we are seeing in this picture is the filamentary structure of the universe um, and the gaps between are what we call voids. So in three dimensions, this is a two-dimensional picture, but in three dimensions you can imagine if you go um, to your bathroom or your kitchen sink and you, make a, you run a, a shallow sink of um, washing up water because we are having a drought and you, you put the dishwashing liquid in and you make bubbles you can imagine that's what the structure and the texture of our universe looks like. The voids are the insides of the bubbles, and the outsides of the bubbles are where our galaxies live. And where the bubbles touch each other, that's where you have higher densities of, of galaxies coming together at what we would call a node. And so this was hinting that the dark matter also has these sorts of filamentary structures with voids in between. And in fact, dark matter has become very much a part of how we um, explain the evolution of the universe these days. In the theory of what we call um, cold dark matter, <laughs> lambda cold dark matter, where the universe is expanding, if we imagine that things started at a big bang and that the um, density was fairly uniform at the very beginning of the early universe, when we look at today's structure and we see this filamentary structure with voids and filaments and all sorts of things, we have to wonder how it got like that. If we try to do the calculations that matter would have had to collapse, ordinary matter would have had to collapse and clump under gravity to form these large structures, it would have taken matter much longer than the age of the universe to get to the current structure that we see today. Because in the early universe, things were too hot, and the matter was coupled to the, the radiation, um, and they can interact with each other, and they wouldn't have been able, the matter wouldn't have been able to collapse to those structures. We, would have, we needed the dark matter. The dark matter didn't interact with um, the radiation. It could just clump under gravity, uninterrupted. And that would then help the normal matter um, be attracted to, to those areas of higher mass to form the, the structure that we see today. So this is just a, snap, a couple of snapshots from a simulation of the universe, a dark matter simulation, where you have um, a box 
which is your universe filled with dark matter particles, which only interact under gravity, and then you just let that run over time. And this is what happens. And here is this beautiful filamentary structure, which looks just like the structure that we see in galaxies and large scale structures today in the, in the universe. So I'll just end off with what the heck is the stuff? <laughs> Um, and, and so people have postulated things over the years. Um, one of the big um, contenders was what we would call uh, machos, massive compact halo objects. These are things like stellar remnants, stellar mass, black holes left over when stars go, massive stars go supernova, brown dwarves, which I never referred to when we did stellar evolution, but these are balls of gas that are formed at the same time as the star clusters, but these little balls, of, these balls of gas never are massive enough to begin fusion in their cores. So these are what you would call a failed star. Um, possibly white dwarves, these weird degenerate um, remnants from stellar mass um, stars. And then what about some of these very faint, low mass red dwarf stars that we hardly see because they're so faint. What if we're not taking them all into account? People have pretty much systematically been able to go through each of these options and rule them out. So we don't think that there's more matter hiding in these kinds of objects um, than, than, we, than we would expect. So we, we, we've sort of ruled out machos. Um, so that, that brings us to WIMPs. Um, which are the weakly interactive, uh, sorry, interacting massive particles. So they're on the other extreme. These are, are, are big objects. These are subatomic particles. So these are particles smaller than the size of an atom, fundamental particles. Um, and they have to be a kind of particle that we have never detected before in particle physics experiments. And they have to be massive. Um, and prob probably only interact, because they're massive, they can interact gravitationally, of course, but perhaps they interact via the weak force, which is one of the other fundamental forces of nature. The weak forces, things that interact via the weak force are notoriously difficult to detect. One of those particles is, is the neutrino, which, which is a notoriously difficult particle to, to capture in an experiment. Um, so perhaps there's a, a new generation of, well not a new, a, a generation of neutrinos that we've never seen before that are very massive and that we've never managed to detect. Um, and people are actively looking for those um, in many particle physics experiments across the, the, the world. Of course, the last option is you used the wrong equations. And actually, you got gravity wrong. And uh, maybe at the big scales that we're talking about, at the sizes of galaxies or galaxy clusters, you need to use a modified form of gravity. And so there is a, an active but small group of um, well-respected astrophysicists who work in this area looking at modified gravity. It has had um, some successes and failures in the past at predicting what rotation curves of galaxies should look like. But it's probably not, not, it's not the mainstream. Most, most astronomers or astrophysicists that you ask think that it's probably, dark matter is probably a subatomic particle. Um, but this hasn't been completely ruled out. And so as I was referring to, people are searching for this. <laughs> Given that when we estimate more than 90% of the matter in the universe is dark, and that all the stuff we can see makes up less than 10%. Um, you know, you'd think it would be easy to find. We should run into this stuff. And we possibly we are running into it all the time. Like we're running into, neutrinos are running into us all the time. They just don't bother us. Um, and so this is a nice overview of just where in the world um, some of the dark matter detection experiments um, are, are taking place. Um, other places that they might look for them are the CERN um, Large Hadron Collider, where you are colliding energy, uh, particles at very high energies, where you can create a heavy particle and then try to detect it in your detector. And then there is a, a dark matter experiment, um, detection experiment, placed on the International Space Station, um, currently running, um, trying to, to see whether it can detect signatures of dark matter particles. And so there's lots of interesting theoretical ideas. There's lots of interesting experiments. 
We don't have the answer yet, but uh, hopefully we will soon. So thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.